We are in Isaiah chapter 23. The first seven verses of this chapter deals with an announcement of doom uh, regarding the city of Tyre. Uh, it's going to be destroyed. That uh, that destruction will be felt in many places. Uh, so we had gotten down to verse 5 in that discussion where Isaiah says as at the report concerning Egypt so shall they be sorely pained at the report of Tyre. I think the American standard in New King James may be expressed a little bit better as to when the report reaches Egypt regarding Tyre's destruction. Uh, it is a report, but it's not concerning Egypt. It's when it gets to Egypt concerning Tyre. Uh, and when they get that report, they're going to be greatly distressed, sore pained. <laughs> uh, kind of an interesting uh, wording there. Sore pained. Uh, the pain is great. While they are distressed about not so much their, because of their love for or affection of Tyre, or you might say in regards to Egypt, regarding any nation. It's not a love for that, those nations. But in this situation, their commercial uh, contacts have ceased. They were making money. That's who they were trading with. That's where their money was coming from now, to a great extent. And that has ended. So they are distressed or sore pained at the fact that their commercial interests are been destroyed. Uh, wouldn't that cause any of us a lot of distress if the way in which we were making our money, uh, that that all of a sudden ended, that it ceased. Well, that's the way in which Egypt's feeling. But there also might be another aspect or a couple of others. If such a powerful nation as Tyre had been destroyed, then there's the thinking, at least in the back of the mind, it might happen to us as well. Uh, United States is kind of isolated as far as other nations. But you go into some nations and they are surrounded by other nations and they're all... Well, if one of them falls to whatever it might be, they get concerned. If they fail, we might. Um, also, Phoenicia, which Tyre is in the Phoenician area, that entire area being Phoenicia, it served as a buffer nation. And what I mean by that is that nations, in order to get to Egypt, would have to come down through Phoenicia. And then there was also the Philistines. But those served as buffer nations. 
So if Phoenicia is destroyed, then that buffer is going away and those nations now can come down into Egypt and then they are at war. Uh, several times Egypt, in order to prevent that, would support those nations in Canaan. Uh, how many times does God warn the Israelites? Don't worry about, don't, uh, don't rely upon Egypt. Because Egypt was very willing to support those nations. Why? Because if you can stop them up there, they don't get here. Which where, where would we rather fight them? Not at home, is it? So they would support them. Well, now the entire is destroyed. So what? They're kind of distressed at that because that buffer zone between them and the aggressive nation is going to be non-existent now. So in verse 6, Pass ye over to Tarshish, how ye inhabitants of the isle. The idea of Passover here is to flee to Tarsus. And as they were fleeing, they were to howl, wail, a great moaning because of the destruction of Tyre. They're having to flee and uh, they're sad and saddened through that. <clears throat> this advice to flee to Tarshish may have been followed to a certain extent, uh, but we also note, for example, in verse 12, that they fled to Chittim, which is Carthage. Uh, verse 12 saying, And he said, Thou shalt no more rejoice, thou oppressed virgin, virgin, daughter of Zidon, arise, pass over to Chittim. There also shalt thou have no rest. So they fled. Chittim is Carthage, so they some of them would flee to Carthage. But again, according to that, they're not going to have rest there. So you flee from one place because of the aggressive nation. Now then, what happens? They just come right to where you fled. So that's what's happened with fleeing to Carthage. They should have fled to Tarshish. Uh, this fleeing happened first under the siege by Nebuchadnezzar. But then, as we noted, I think last week in talking about Tyre, Nebuchadnezzar, while he destroyed the main city, the island city, he never did reach. Uh, Alexander the Great, later on, he took the ruins of the first city, the mainland city, and made a causeway out to the island city and took it. Uh, so they were fleeing under both situations, both under Nebuchadnezzar, but then later on with Alexander the Great. In verse 7 then, Is this your joyous city, whose antiquity is of ancient days, 
her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. Isaiah is basically asking if this pile of rubbish is their joyous city. It's rubbish now because of first Nebuchadnezzar and then Alexander the Great. It was a city that her allies had boasted of and boasted of its antiquity. It was an old city. Pulpit commentary noted as to the ancient aspect of Tyre, and they, it's, quote, Herodotus was told about 450 B.C. that its temple of Hercules, or Melkarth, had been built 2,300 years previously. Well, if you take uh, 2,300 and then add 450 B.C. to that, that takes you to 2,750 B.C. That's an old city. And so, uh, uh, whose antiquity? The Ancient of Days. <laughs> And the idea of her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. They are going to be walking on their own feet, uh, carrying or walking to the enemy's land to live. They've been conquered. The conquering nation now carries them away with them having to walk to the, to the enemy's land. The next section, verses 8 through verse 12, uh, I have God purposed the destruction because of the pride of Tyre. Now, we all can remember several passages, no doubt, dealing with pride. Uh, probably one of the most famous would be Solomon's statement, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Everybody remembers that one, don't we? Uh, but there's a whole lot of others in the Scriptures dealing with pride. Tyre was a proud city. And God is going to destroy them because of that pride, uh, is basically what he's saying. In verse 8, then, who have taken this counsel against Tyre, the crowning cities, whose merchants are princes, who trafficker, whose traffickers are honorable of the earth, or the honorable of the earth. In this, he's basically asking, who would think of destroying such a powerful, great city as Tyre? It would be folly to try to think of destroying it, at least from a human standpoint. Uh, but God is the one, of course, who's going to be bringing this destruction Here, in regards to this, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, honorable of the earth. He's showing the greatness of Tyre, but also uh, that Tyre bestowed crowns because of its great commercial power. Uh, someone read Ezekiel. 2733. Okay, you enrich the kings of the earth. 
by their goods, their riches, their merchandise. They were the traffickers or traders of the Canaanites. And as we see here, famed for their commerce, uh, making other people rich because of it. Dale, you want to ask something? Well, I just wanted to bring this one interesting verse. Uh, I don't know if you had that in your reference. The Son of Man prays for the sons of Tyre, and thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God. I said in the seat of, of God, from the midst of trees, that you are a man and not a God, but you set your heart like the heart of a God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel, etc. and it goes on. Their pride again. Were, were gods, and that's the way they considered themselves. That's the way others considered them to a certain extent as well. Uh, they just were held as in such honor and esteem that that's the way. They viewed themselves and others viewed them as they were gods. Uh, and that doesn't mean God in the sense of even an idol or Jehovah, but used in the sense of someone who's great. And that, that would be the sense that they are, they consider themselves great. Uh, no one can destroy us, which comes back to verse 8 here. No one would even consider trying to because of the strength and the power that they had. Uh, so in verse 9, The Lord of hosts hath purposed it to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Man, by his own thinking and counsel, might not take it upon himself to destroy the city. But God does. And God is the one who purposed this destruction. God hates their pride, their arrogance. And as a result, he's going to stain, dishonor. He's going to profane their pride. Hold it in contempt. They prided themselves in their glory, their beauty. And God rendered those, those honorable things contemptible. What we pride ourselves in many th times is not what God considers we should be proud about. Uh, and I'm using pride in a couple of different senses there, even though the basic idea is the same. We pride ourselves in the things of this world many times. Uh, watch how someone acts when they get a brand new car, hot off the you know, showcase floor. And how that they show that off. They're proud about that. Okay, Dale. Uh, Daniel 4, 37. Now I have Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his way is justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Okay, that goes back to another verse of pride. Uh, but we... We pride ourselves in things of this world so many times. Uh, 
when it's a new car, what about a brand new house or uh, we get something else that's brand new and we are proud of that. We have a lot of, you know, uh, we think highly of those things. Uh, we do it as Christians even. I'm not saying that that's entirely wrong, but I'm just trying to make a comparison in relationship to that thinking as opposed to the thinking of God. What does God think about those things? Read 2 Peter 3 and you'll find out <laughs> that all of this earth, all of the elements are going to be destroyed, going to burn with fervent heat. Elements will, be, will melt. What does God think about those new things that we have? Not very highly, does he? Uh, what should we? Uh -huh. No, all pride is not bad. And that's why I said I, uh, I was about to use it in a positive way. Um, In a godly way, absolutely. Um, most of you, when you get up in the morning, most of us fix our hair, if we have any, uh, or have enough to fix. Uh, you know, we get dressed up, we try to look, uh, have an appearance of looking good. What does that come from? That's pride. Uh, when does it get wrong? When it becomes excessive. <laughs> That's when it becomes wrong. Um, but yes, that's a result of pride, that we just clean up and try to be presentable. Um, if... Uh, if we have company coming, what do we do? <laughs> I, I say a couple. <laughs> because people spend hour upon hour upon hour cleaning up the house. Why? Because we've got company coming. What's it as a result of? Pride. We want our house looking nice. Don't want it looked and junked up and don't want people thinking that we're dirty and all of this and so we clean it up there's nothing wrong with that but it is an aspect of pride that causes us to do that nothing wrong um, I, I can attest to the fact that yours is not the only one like that. That has to be cleaned by the owner before they will allow the housekeeper to come in and clean it. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, what... <laughs> Uh, what might be waste to one person is not to another person. Uh, I'll use a couple of illustrations that uh, I heard someone use, uh, but in a different context. Uh, someone can spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on a boat and fishing tackle and that's fine. That's, I mean, that's wonderful. Someone else over here looks at that and says, that is a total waste of money. And that person goes out and spends $1,000 on brand new golf clubs and a membership at the golf club. 
and the person over here who's bought all that uh, fishing equipment says, that is a total waste of money. <laughs> the point being, what is a waste of money to one person might not be to another person. That's, uh, we're talking about Sunday afternoon Christian liberty. We have the right within the parameters of what God has authorized to do with our money as we will as long as we give properly to the Lord. So there is that, though. We generally are proud of those things, though, aren't we? They mean a lot to us. What should be the most meaningful thing to us is within the spiritual realm. There needs to be a pride in the spiritual realm. As Paul mentioned, uh, we should be proud of this congregation, the faithfulness of this congregation, that we have remained true to God's Word and all that that uh, involves. There should be a pride that is there. Um, there should be a pride with our children, especially when they obey the gospel and they start living the Christian life. We should be proud of that. We've done that which God has wanted us to do. And you fathers, provoke not your children in wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There are those principles that are set forth. And our obedience to those does cause pride on our part. And God would be proud of us in that sense in doing those things. But it's the emphasis of what I was trying to deal with. We pride ourselves so many times on the wrong things instead of the right things. And many times in the raising of children, the reason that our children go astray later on in life is because we really emphasize the physical things more so than the spiritual things. We've been more proud of the physical than the, than the spiritual. And the children recognize that growing up, and as a result, they're off in the world. Because in reality, that's what we took pride in instead of the spiritual aspect. Um, well, Eli is a... Uh, Eli was a faithful man, though. Uh, his children went astray, and he restrained them not because of that failure to restrain them uh, God was going to bring judgment upon both the, his children and him but uh, I'm not sure that we could say that he necessarily prided or was more interested in the physical than he was the spiritual it's just that he, he did not restrain his children properly uh, and with Eli, his children should have been put to death for the things that they were doing. But he allowed them to continue. Uh, he fell over backwards and died. <laughs> That's, you're right. You could see his spiritual out. A spiritual view is the report, your children are dead. Nothing happens. The ark has been taken. Shot to such an extent he falls over backward and dies. It was a spiritual that was important to him. Um, spiritual should be important to us as well though. That's what where our emphasis should lie, not on the physical. This world, uh, 
when we die, we leave everything behind. Uh, there's all of those adages that we all know about leaving everything behind. But they're old adages because they're true. Uh, we can't take anything with us except those spiritual things that we have put back in this world where we are laying up treasures in heaven and not on earth. And by doing that, yes, we take those with us. Our works do follow them, do follow us. Uh, but the things of this world, the riches of this world, the pride, the prestige, um, what is Tyre today? Great city, isn't it? We always talk about it, don't we? Uh, if you had to go there, how many could even, would even have any idea of where to go? It's nothing. It's basically the top of a rock now. Um, and yet, at that time, it was a great city. Major metropolis. And as we put here, they're causing others to be rich. They're causing others and uh, putting, bestowing crowns upon their head because of what Tyre did. Should I add that our nation should take heed in regards to these same matters? Uh, how many times is it expressed or thought no one can bring our nation down? Well, that's another illustration, Titanic, but we're not really discussing that. We're discussing now our nation. Uh, if uh, you do some research, uh, you can find the seeds of the destruction of the United States was predicted decades ago as to how it was going to be accomplished, and those things are coming to fruition now. Uh, our nation needs to take heat. We could end up like Tyre, <laughs> because and I add, all of the military power that we might have would not prevent God destroying us if that's what he determines to do. Uh, Assyria, great power. God destroyed them. Babylon, great power of his. God destroyed them. Now, remember the handwriting on the wall. Thou art weighed in the balances and found warning. Oh. Is God going to, not a physical or literal writing with a finger on the wall, but is he going to weigh the United States in balances and decide we've been found wanting? And so our land will be destroyed. Uh, and... I know from a stand, one standpoint, I'm preaching to the choir. But it's our responsibility to go out and be that light and influence others to where we're brought back to at least some sense of morality within our land. If we don't influence them in that way, who's going to do it? How's it going to be accomplished if we're not the ones who are actively doing that? So while I'm 
preaching to the choir, I'm also trying to urge us to become and to make our influence felt among others. Verse 10 then. Pass through thy land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no more strength. The colonies of Tyre are no longer restrained, and so they can do pretty much as whatever they want. Uh, Tyre, when they went out, they would set up colonies as to go to a certain place, and that's where they would do trade. And that colony would influence that entire area. Now then, with Tyre being destroyed, they can do whatever they want to. The overflow, or passing thy land as a river, uh, the river there would probably be the Nile, Nile River. And he's using that as an illustration. The overflow like a river. Uh, the daughter of Tarshish would include all of those suburbs, the colonies, the inhabitants of Tarshish. The strength is a belt or a girdle that you know, holds in the tummy. Uh, it's no longer there, and so what happens? The stomach kind of expands, doesn't it? Uh, there's no restraining power. That's what he's saying. As the power of Tyre is gone. Uh, Rolf Luffner stated that, quote, history records that one colony, Carthage, became a mighty commercial and naval power after Tyre's demise, end quote. Notice that it's after their demise. Before their demise, before they were Tyre was destroyed, Tyre kept control of it. But now then... There's no more control, there's no more restraining power, and so Carthage then becomes a, a great commercial power. In verse 11, he stretched out his hand over the sea, he shook the kingdoms, the Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. So Yahweh stretched out his hand is that here's God's power being demonstrated. The sea and the kingdoms has reference to the Phoenician coast. Uh, basically in, in that area, each one of their cities had their own king. So, the kingdoms has reference to all of each one of them being considered its own kingdom in a sense, even though the entire area was Phoenicia. The merchant city uh, probably has been reference to Phoenicia maybe even extending up to all of Canaan. Uh, Rolf Ruffner again pointed out, quote, this may refer to Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Sidon, Joppa, Akko, as well as Tyre, end quote. Now then, one of the things that we'll add, and we'll probably have to stop with this, is that what Isaiah is saying here gives these cities plenty of time to repent. Uh, 
now then we know that they're not going to or that they don't. Uh, but God has given the opportunity for them to repent. God is patient. He's long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but what? That all should come to repentance. Uh, that's God doesn't want to destroy anyone in that sense. He would far rather a nation of people, individuals, come to repent instead of being destroyed. Uh, so he gives time to repent. And that's what he's done here. He has given them time to repent by these prophecies in regard, by Isaiah. And just as closing thought, this also points out that God was not just concerned with Israel during this period of time. He was concerned with everyone, with all people, not just Israel. Now his main concern was with that chosen people, but he was concerned with all of the nations, all of the people, because God loves all men everywhere. We'll start. That God will take care of us. We have those promises. And isn't that great that uh, God has given us those promises that you know, whatever might come, we can remain faithful and God will take care of us. I will, promise is, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that I may boldly say, what shall man do unto me? Man can't harm the Christian. We'll stop there and then start with verse 12, Lord willing, next week.